So guys, welcome to episode one of uh, 10 Second Gems. And as promised, um, episode one is going to be awesome. We got a very uh, special guest. I'm not going to introduce him. I'm going to let him introduce himself. So welcome to the podcast. You want to introduce yourself to everybody? Hello. <laughs> uh, yes. I'm Cletus. <laughs> My name is Michael Mascio. Um I'm one of those guys that at the start of a show, you see 19 producer names. I'm one of them. One of those guys. But there's a way to figure out who's actually the producer. Really? It's a trick, yeah. Watch the, the, the credits as they come up. And it will be producer, 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 producer. One of them will say, produced by. See, I've always wondered about that. <clears throat> when negotiations came up 20 years ago, suddenly writers all wanted to be producers. They wanted was more money. Mm. Studios weren't giving them more money, but they said, we'll make you an associate producer. Well, that didn't fly very long because then all the editors wanted to be producers. So they had to give the editors associate producers. They figured it's post-production associate producer. So the writers, they said, we're going to make you a producer. Cool. Took the writers, who are supposed to be smart. A long time to figure out, well, wait a minute, we didn't get any more money. No, you're not going to. Uh -huh. The one credit for the guy who's actually producing a show is produced, produced by. by. Well, okay, so first of all, well, there's a gem right there, all right? So... For those of you that that are that are listening to this or watching this on YouTube, um, I don't buy you. I've always wondered why there's so many damn producer names, and there you go. So the real guy is produced by everybody else is either what a writer or writer, <clears throat> poser, girlfriend of the exec producer, <laughs> but it's not. They wouldn't be able to find the set if they had to. Nice. Okay. All right. Well, are you, we didn't get your name. <laughs> we did at the beginning, but it's Michael, last name Mascio, M-A-S-C-H-I-O. Michael Mascio. And uh, so, um, what do you what what have you been doing in your life for the last? Year? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, I wanted to. So, okay, so this is Michael Mascio. Uh, Michael Mascio and I are related. He is my <clears throat> he is my wife's uncle. But he's also a TV and film producer, has been for how long? I used to say 30 years, and then I realized it's like almost 50. Holy so, crap, wow. Yeah, well, not always as a producer. I, I started, as all good nepotism kids did, uh, I came up, actually I started in theater. Hmm. And uh, I was at pre-med at UCLA. You were pre-med? Yeah. <laughs> I was pre-med. Both my parents were in the industry. I was pre-med. Wow. But I had opened a theater when I was 15. <clears throat> uh, a group of us in, in my class at Beverly High was Ricky Dreyfus, Rob Reiner, Phil Mishkin, uh, Jesus, Larry Bishop, Joey Bishop's kid, Julie Cobb, Lee J. Cobb's daughter. It was a, just, it was a good class. And we got Beverly Hills Parks and Recreation, which had a little, I think it was a 60-seater. Uh, they, through funding donations by Martin Landau, by a lot of the, the families, let us open the Roxbury Park Players. <laughs> and we were, you know, typical 15-year-olds. We're doing Satra's No Exit. You know, we're doing things. We couldn't pronounce the shows we were doing. At 15, though, that's pretty impressive. But then I, you know, medicine, I always loved medicine. And so I went to, uh, to UCLA's pre-med, theater arts minor, pre-med major. And got a call one day from a man named Albert McCleary who was an old, old friend of my father's, who had created a show called Matinee Theater, which was the first live drama every day. Hmm. Five days a week, a live hour drama on television. Imagine the concept. And he had just taken over 
the Pasadena Playhouse. And he said, I got a spot for you, kid. And I went, okay, <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> so I went to the Pasadena Playhouse, finished up there, and then I went to New York uh, to become a page at NBC. In New York? In New York, how 30 old, Rock. How old were you at that point? Uh, 19, 20. It was three years out of college. Okay. And I'll, <laughs> my introduction in New York was epic. I arrived looking really good. I had <laughs> the charcoal gray slacks, the blue double-breasted blazer, the blue button-down. I looked great. <laughs> and the head of the page service called me in his office after two weeks. And his exact words were, we realize you've just arrived and your trunk has probably not made it yet. <laughs> but proper attire for NBC, black suit, white shirt, black tie, white pocket square, black shoes. Whoa. Yeah. He told you. <laughs> oh, did he tell me. But for the prince, what was I? I was making $56 a week. That was my take home. Okay. <laughs> but my dad set it up at 21 at, God, two other bars in New York. I could sign for one drink. In New York. I, in New York. I was allowed to go in and sign his tab for one drink. Then I would go to Horn and Hardit's and take the food home. Horn and Hardit's, for those of you that don't know, was an actual cafeteria with the food on plates behind doors, and you put your quarters in and took out the plate you wanted. Okay. That was it. But that, you know, there were some fun memories. Hmm. That was so that you were you were 19, 20 years old. Yeah. You ended up, so did you, when did you end up back in L.A., or did you go back to L.A.? Yeah, I did. <clears throat> I, uh, I made key position, which is the top 10 out of the 45 pages. In New York, the winning In New still, York, okay. right. <clears throat> and we did the Tonight Show, the Today Show, you know, all of that stuff. And I got an offer to go to NBC L.A., Burbank. Okay. And I said, uh, got to do that. Wanted to go home. Pleasure Winter. going home, yeah. Yeah. What, uh, if you could, let's let's drop a gem here, <clears throat> if possible. So for anyone, any young person that's looking to get into, into film, uh, would you say, first of all, would you say that going for a position as a page is a good way to is one of the good ways to get into that world? Or would you would you say, if if you and I were talking, would you steer me more in that direction? Or would you say, no, don't do that, go this way instead? If you wanted to get into the industry, in the corporate side, be a page. Okay. You'll learn the ins and outs of the corporate end of it, the finance end of it, that's great. If you want to get into being a filmmaker, if you want to go out there and try and produce, try and be an assistant director, try, no, not the way to go. It was just pure core. And that's what I realized once I was there. Everybody was, you know, wanted to get in the corporate side. I didn't want the corporate side. I want to be on a set. So you weren't a page, you were a suit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> as I was told very quickly, go buy that black suit. So. Man. And w w were there any. Um would you what would be the biggest don't as as a pay, as a young page getting into that world oh uh don't drink as much as we did because <laughs> that that had dire consequences and i we locked johnny carson out of his limo we thought it was funny whoa 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 it wait, wasn't. okay wait, we got to hear that story <laughs> start from the beginning with that story start from <laughs> we did the tonight show and that was a tough show to do. There were a million people wanted to come see it. But the requirements for filling an audience were very strict on who we would allow in and who filled the front rows. You know, what did they look like? How were they dressed? Were they sober? Were they not sober? And he had a say in all of that? All of oh, that God, stuff. yes. It, he ran it. Wow. Nighttime television out of New York, Johnny Carson. <clears throat> that was it. 
We didn't like him too much in the Page Corps. Uh, all the shows sent us Christmas gifts. We had our own room. We had a green room for pages. Okay. As I said, there were over 40 of us. And we were in uniform, and we wore gold uh, key on the sleeve. You know how important we were. <laughs> uh, because when it was a snowy, cold night, we were out hustling bars, finding people to bring in to watch our shows. Really? Oh, yeah. You had to fill an audience. Yeah, yeah. In the middle of a blizzard, you're still shooting it. So we had to go out and find it. Huh. So we started getting back at him. We would do little things like seating the audience. We'd say, look, Ed McMahon's going to come out, and he'll do his warm-up, and then he's going to say, and here's Johnny. Nobody say anything. Nobody <laughs> applaud. Just sit silent. You, this is the audience. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. John, Johnny was not pleased with us for doing that. So that year, uh, the Pages got a six-pack of beer from The Tonight Show. That was sent <clears throat> as the Christmas gift. A six-pack of beer. A six-pack of beer <laughs> to 40-some-odd guys. <clears throat> you had to follow Johnny when he left 30 Rock. He went out a side door. As you're right at Rockefeller Plaza, the ice skating rink, the whole thing. Went out a side door, that lim his limo was always there. The guy in the limo would jump out, run over with an umbrella if it was a bad night, and bring Carson to the car. We as pages were there to like, no, no, don't come near him. Didn't take much when Carson's driver jumped out with the umbrella, left the car running, <laughs> to just go over and hit that lock button. And now he's standing there with an umbrella, a pissed off host, and we're letting all the people come in. You want his autograph? Here he is, folks. Toward, toward Johnny. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Shortly after that, I headed back to the West Coast. <laughs> Very shortly. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I was back in my element. We were actually doing shows. We were having fun in, 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 LA. in L.A. Oh, yeah. God, yes. <clears throat> Did you... Um... Did you enjoy that time in New York? Or do you feel like... Um, I made some friends. Yeah. But no, I didn't enjoy it. It, it. I'd come out of theater where we were doing it. I mean, I was an equity stage manager because I got fired as an actor. We, we, were, we, we were doing stuff. You know, you built sets. You, you, I'm in New York wearing a suit, and my biggest task was... Name recognition. We had to study a picture of all the executives at NBC mm. so that when they got in, he said, Hello, Mr. Jones. How are you? It was, it was nonsense. I wanted yeah. to be doing shows. Yeah. And I, 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 um, that's one job that I would have hated because one thing I never liked about the music industry was the ass kissing part of it. Yeah. And, the, oh, hey, here's so and so. So your niece and I, <laughs> um, <laughs> They used to do a thing here called um, GMA Week. It's like the Grammys for for Christian music, gospel, and and, and contemporary music. And <clears throat> your niece is your niece. She's been around all this stuff all her life. Um, I come from the ghettos of Philadelphia. We just most people that come from where I come from, we don't really care to be up people's behinds or up people's asses, uh, for lack of better words. And so we would leave these parties. We would leave. We would be there maybe 10, 15 minutes, and we would take off. And, our, and my phone would be ringing the whole time. Hey, so-and-so's at this party. Why did you leave? And me and Bridget would just be like, ah, we're done. And we would leave. So just hearing that, hearing that that was the gig, the, I, I probably would have been pretty miserable doing yeah. that job. And I'm sure you were, especially if you were more of a hands-on type of person. And I was miserable. But I did not take the lesson to heart, which I should have. Okay. Because it only got more ass kissing as you go up the food chain. Mm. And that's, I, I was never the guy to join, you know, this golf club and that poker game on the Wednesday. I didn't want it. I didn't want to do it. I'd bust my ass on a set. I don't want to go home. Yeah. I never wanted to play that game. And quite honestly, 
I don't know the music business, but it's got to be the same. The Peter principle is rampant. Yeah. And the Peter principle is simple, failing upwards. Hmm. Every studio and network executive is a failed producer. I mean, it's just wow. that they can't do it on their own. So they put them in charge and then they'll tell producers how to do it. Now, is that why, <clears throat> first of all, there's guys that that's a freaking, that's beyond the gym, failing upward. All right, so we're going to break this down. Uh, Michael is going to break this down. Um, <clears throat> I completely forgot my thought just because of <laughs> I need to use, I, I got to steal that feeling upper. But okay, my, so my thought, my question was, is this why a lot of these suits, because in a lot of podcasts I watch, uh, Joe Rogan and a bunch of these other comedians I watch, uh, Bill Burr, who's, um, Bill is very vocal about he doesn't like those guys coming down to the studio to tell him how to do his show or sending notes. So is that why, is that why a lot of those guys like to get involved because they were failed and now they have an opportunity to... They have to justify their existence. Right. You're hiring me because I'm going to make your shows better. I'm going to bring in ratings. I'm going to... Nobody can do that. You have no idea what's going to work on a show. It's a greatest crapshoot in the world and what's the use of getting in the way of the guys that are really the right because writers if it's it? a hit you brought in a hit believe I told me you guys i told you if it's a failure you've got enough bodies to point at right well it didn't work because he screwed up <laughs> no no they want to be in on that yeah do, do you get to as the producer i'm guessing the answer is yes <clears throat> do you get to sit in on a lot of those editing sessions or do you just get daily? No, because the editing's ongoing. When you say editing, you're talking about film editing or script editing? Well, j both actually. Yeah. How does... Um, script what? editing, yes. Not film. Because okay. I'm I'm shooting. You're out shooting, yeah. right. And you're, you're sending back footage. So it's an ongoing thing. Ongoing. Okay. If you're doing episodic television, which was really my forte, uh, you're turning over shows. You know, it's 21 days and it became 14 days. So you've got two teams of editors going. Hmm. You're, cu you're almost a camera with your cutting. In other wow. words, you know, you turn in your dailies and it's cut the next day. So, now, what, what, does, uh, what does a writing in a writing room, right? Because I've always yeah. been curious about what is a day for you when you go into a writing room, are you just kind of there? I don't go in the writing room. You don't? No. Okay. Again, <clears throat> that's a full-time on... Ongoing. That's, okay. Those are the producers. Who right, are right. <laughs> the scripts come to me. Well, Spencer for Hire. Great fun series. We shot the entire thing in Boston. Right. The writers were in L.A. So you automatically have a little bit of a problem because they would write these wonderful scenes and he would get them and go, I can't close the Tobin Bridge. Mm. <laughs> uh, we can't do that. <clears throat> so we would then have to send back ideas. Can we move that scene here? Can we make this play day? Can we? That's the thing you had to do. When the first scripts are coming out, they follow the standard studio precept that seven day show, Four on, three out. Okay. That's it. Why are we going to Boston to film a show on a stage? So we immediately flipped that. And then we flipped it again. And we wound up being two days out, or two days on stage, five days out. Out in the city. In the city, on the street, filming what really happens. Is that your favorite way to work? Out oh, God, yes. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. You, you bump into little problems along the way. We had a great end scene of the third act, and it was stakeout of their witness's house. They knew there was gonna be a hit, and sure enough, here come the bad guys, shoot out, shoot out, act out. Come back in for the fourth act. It's the next day, it's obviously morning. There's a morgue wagon and cops and everyone, and they're all discussing the shootout. How do you film that? Well, you film it in reverse, obviously. Film the day work first, then you go to night. 
So we filmed the day work. And there we are with the body and thing. Now we set up for night. As we start laying cable and stretching lights, it starts to snow. I don't mean a little snow. I mean blizzard snow. So by the time we shoot the scene, it's almost a whiteout. We've got this great gunfight going. We've got Hawk slides across the hood of the car, snow flying everywhere. And the director is saying, this won't cut. <laughs> this is not going to cut. How are we going to have this shootout? Go to commercial, come back up, and there are bare trees and piles of leaves and the bodies coming out. I said, just keep shooting. Just mm. keep shooting. They'll figure it out. You know what? Nobody said anything. It worked out. It worked out. They thought it was a very cool night scene. Yeah, yeah. Nobody cared that it was snowing like a son of a bitch for the night shot. And now we're the next morning and there's no snow. No anywhere. snow on the ground. <laughs> Nobody cared. Well, that's, I mean, that happens. Sometimes it snows out and then the next morning it's gone. So I'm sure that didn't matter very much. And, yeah. and, and <clears throat> I'm glad you brought up uh, Spencer. So uh, <clears throat> when I was a kid, uh, my, my, um, my mom's brother, uh, he is my uncle, but I call him my mom's brother. He had um, he had a, a a stretch like a two hour stretch every day, where he the TV was his and uh, Spencer for hire. Uh, then he would go to another channel for Hogan's Heroes, which I hated with a passion. <laughs> and then um, he would watch Fall Guy, okay, which I liked. Um. He would basically for and it was this was three four times a week. He would come to the house, eat lunch, and then for a few hours he was watching his shows. And uh, so uh, you produced Spencer for Hire. Uh, how was how was it shooting in Boston? How many seasons did you guys have? Three three seasons. Yeah. How was that shooting in Boston? And then you had there was a black co lead. This is in Boston in the eighties, right? Yeah. It was yeah, it was the eighties. Eighty four, five, six, seven. So we started eighty four and we finished in seven, but it was three seasons. Hmm. Each season then was twenty two episodes. Was there um was it challenging having um a, a black co lead at that time? on a show that was really doing well? Was that a challenge no, for you guys in terms no, of... No, it, no. Uh, it wasn't a challenge. We were concerned going into it, but Boston was a fabulous city to film in. Okay. We had tremendous support. And the Teamsters, who, you know, historically are the bane of problems... Right. It didn't take them long to realize this is a steady gig. Okay. Let's not screw it up. Yeah. So they weren't going to mess their money up over, no. over something that, that silly. To the point that when we weren't sure if we were getting our third season, they came back and said, we're waiving any increases if that'll help guarantee the season. Hmm. So that was a big deal. The union did, the, the Teamsters. The Teamsters. Ha. It was a big deal. Okay. They they figured that out right away. There were some moments on set that were I, I don't know what language I can use on your podcast. It's a so, podcast. We had the first year we brought a lot of LA crew in because we needed episodic television people. Right. The idea being that we'd, in certain key departments, we would do one-on-one. -on -one. We'd have a local guy who would follow the L.A. guy so that the next season or halfway through the season, the local guy could replace him. Right. But people like assistant <clears throat> directors, that's hard anywhere. So we had a couple of New York ADs. And we had this one kid, and he was aggressive in New York. You know, and we're, we're, we're shooting on the streets. This was all on the street. So it's like, get, you know, move, move aside. No, no, don't, 
Don't look at the camera. No, don't stand there. It, it was challenging. And I didn't like what I was seeing. And, and Bob Yurick, who's very, very conscious, was very conscious of perception and acceptance in a neighborhood, just said, you know, either fire him or real fast attitude adjustment. So we took him aside. We were filming in the North End, which is predominantly the Italian area of right. Boston. And this is why I'm asking, because I know about <laughs> Boston in the 80s. So. Yeah. So we're filming there, and I just reamed this kid. I said, you know, we're in their neighborhood. We're, we're guests in this city. You're going to treat these people with respect. Right. There was a little old couple. He's got a cane. She's holding on to him. And they stop right in the middle of the shot. And they're staring. Okay, you know, cut. Let's do a reset. And I said, polite. Be polite. He goes up to them. And it's like, hi, folks. We're filming a show here. And could I ask you to just maybe move this way around the thing? The wife leans up to the husband and whispers something. And the husband leans over to the kid and goes, go fuck yourself. <laughs> 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 and the kid looks at me and I went, uh, yeah, okay. Well, we can leave them alone and we'll just adjust <laughs> camera angle. And I thought, okay, it's just never going to work, is it? <laughs> and this is in Boston. And this is in Boston. Boston, God, I love Boston. Boston was so, I'll tell a story on Bob because he'd been a, a dear friend for a long time and we had just done America together. And, but Bob is an actor. And as an actor, recognition was important for Bob. And we would meet on weekends. We would go and do things all over the city. But he loved going to Quincy Market, Faneuil Hall. Big popular tourist area. The marketplace is great, the food court. And Bob owned whatever block he was on. You know, you know what's here? Yes, I live there, Bob. I do know what's here. No, no, he, he would expand on everything. And this is where they make the best pizza. And people are like, yeah, we know that. We, <laughs> we, we live here. <laughs> Bob would show up <clears throat> in a jacket, baseball cap, dark glasses. But if he hadn't been pegged in like 20 minutes, he was not happy. Yeah. He so wanted to be noticed. The sunglasses would come off. <clears throat> and then the hat would come off. And then the voice would get just a little bit louder. And somebody would say, hey, it's Yurich. It's Rabbit Yurich. <laughs> Rabbit. Rabbit Yurich, hey, it's Spencer. And he would go, oh, <laughs> yeah, hi, guys, yeah, everything. <laughs> and I saw a film years later. I think it was called Soap Dish. It was a spoof on soap operas. Will be Goldberg. A lot of people. It's funny as hell. That's exactly what the lead actress would do. When she was having a bad day, she would go out in public and step ahead of her, her producer, and the producer would say, Oh, look, there's so and so. Oh, okay. And I thought, You need that. <clears throat> you just need that moment. Great story of that with Bob. He had a boat up in Gloucester and we would go up and go sailing. And every time we would go up, we would pass this little restaurant, mom and pop shop, chicken. And he would say, that's the best. That place is so good. So Ron McClarty, who played Sergeant Belson on the series, was with us one day and we're going up to Gloucester. And Bob starts, yeah, that place is the best. And McClarty says, well, let's go. Yeah, we're just going up to see the boat. Let's go. So in we go. We order lunch. It was god awful. Well, it, was it was the bad. worst food. <laughs> and nobody's saying anything. And I'm thinking, God, Bob loves this place. So. But McClarty didn't care. He said, Robert. That sucked. That was just <laughs> dreadful. And Yurik said, yeah, it really did. And I said, but Bob, you always talk about it. He said, 
Well, it looks like it should be good. It looks like. <laughs> And I thought, so you've never actually been there? Never been there. Oh, It's my the God. perception. He's that guy. Yeah. <laughs> looks like it should be great. It's great. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the A-Team. So oh. we haven't talked very much about the A-Team <clears throat> just in our hanging out. But so you worked on the A-Team for a couple seasons, right? I worked on A-Team. I was not the producer. I think my title was executive production manager. I monitored, this was for Stephen Cannell. Okay. And when I started with Stephen, we were doing Greatest American Hero. Okay. But then he just started launching shows and shows and shows. Wait, Greatest American Hero was... Uh... William Catt. That was the Robert Culp. The guy that was the terrible, right? He he crashed when he flew. What had happened was a spaceship <laughs> went by and a piece of luggage fell out. Happens. <laughs> <laughs> he finds the suitcase. And in the suitcase is the suit. And if he wears the suit, he can fly. He's impervious to bullets. But there's no instruction manual. And that was the whole premise of the show. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, I remember. So he could fly, but <clears throat> terribly. Yeah, terribly. He crashed into everything. <laughs> Robert Culp played the, it wasn't FBI, it was a secret, you know, police military organization that was there to monitor him because, you know, we didn't want the world to know that spaceship dropped a piece of luggage. So that was the premise of the show. Connie Selica was his girlfriend. He was a teacher. And uh, Robert Culp. The fun part about that show was that uh, the stuntman, who was doubling for William Catt, who, who played the teacher, came and in the middle of shooting demanded more money to do the flying part. <laughs> do it in mid, mid shoot. Mid shoot. Wow. And I said, really? Uh, he said, yeah, I'm not gonna do it. Now the suit had been custom fit to him. I mean, you're picking a good stunt double because of the physicality of it. Yeah. Or her. So we started negotiating and we used an air ram. It literally launches you into the air or anything else put on an air ram. It's compressed air, and you hit that button, and boom, everything flies. And it push, and it tosses. And it throws him up in the air. Jeez. And I said, okay, uh, for every air ram, we'll bump you up so much. And he went, great. And then he came back, and he said, well, wait a minute. Well, that's just the air ram going up. And I said, yeah. He said, well, what about coming down? I said, that's... That's on you. That's, you know, we'll put you up in the air. You land on your own. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, it. and I wouldn't pay him for the landing. So he wound up, his name, nah, I can't give you his name, but because he's still in the business. But yeah. He ended that up, was did it. he end up walking? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Mid shoot. So, you know, fun stuff. Good times. Jeez. Anyways. What, what was, uh, Mr. <clears throat> T, what was Mr. T like? T was an interesting guy. He, uh, He'd done a couple of movies, most notably uh, uh, Rocky. Well, so he he did Rocky before. Yeah. Eight, oh, oh yeah, that's how we. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's how you figured out how to use him. Uh, but he was a bouncer, primarily. T was a bouncer, so his dialogue was limited, and all the gold chains. That was him. Those were his. That was his deal. Yeah. The Mohawk, all of that was him. But he was a nice guy. He really was this, I must say, Cannell came up with an ingenious thing because we knew we had George Papard, who was, of course, the big lead actor. And then a bunch of guys who were good. How do you parcel out who gets what, who's treated? We created the clubhouse so 
Papard had a trailer. He owned it, and we agreed to rent it. The other guys were put in small motorhomes. Papard was that... Um, George Papard. The guy that always... Yeah. Was. Okay, all right. The head of the unit. Okay. Uh, had been a very successful actor. We rented a really nice big trailer, and we tricked it out. We had a pool table. We had a bar, you no know, liquor, but a bar, soft drinks, TVs, couches, and that became the clubhouse. And only those guys were allowed in it. The actors. That was it. No other actors, no guest stars, no crew, nobody. Hmm. So they didn't have big motor homes. But the idea was we give them their own space and let them bond and see how that all works. And it was, it was very successful. What changed the dynamic slightly was at the end of the first year, Mr. T was hands down one of the most popular figures on the show. On the show, yeah. Uh, and it just, you never know. It happens that way. Was he easy to work with? Yeah. Yeah, I heard a friend of mine, um, well, it's a friend of my father's. He, um, he, was, he was in the pyro business. Mm. He actually did, um, he helped design all the stuff for Waterworld. And oh. um, there was a member, so Die Hard, uh, I think it was Die Hard 3, was the one with Samuel Jackson. Yeah. That beginning scene where in New York, all, this huge explosion. And so he helped set all that up. And he, he actually showed me pictures. I was at his house once. And they had these barrels of gasoline that they had leaned against these these windows, uh, these fronts. Um, I think it was on the Universal lot. And he was showing me how they were setting it all up. But <clears throat> he got to work with him on something uh, can't remember what it was, and of course, as a kid, I'm like, "You work with Mr. T." At? So he and he apparently said that he was like a teddy bear of a guy, that he wasn't really a mean. No, that he was just like a really sweet guy. He's never a mean guy at all. Huh. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, I think that what surprised him and surprises a lot of actors when they go into episodic television is the pace. Mm, okay, it's not like a movie. You know, we're on a finite schedule. You have X number of days to shoot it. And you're talking 55, 58 pages of script has to be done in that, those days. It was a six-day shoot. For one episode. For one episode. So... Pyro, everything. Happened. Everything. Right. We depend today so much on CGI, yeah, computer-generated yeah. imaging. In those days, if you wanted it on film, you did it. You had to explode. You know, that was it. Something's (laughs) going to blow up, it's going to blow up. So that was challenging sometimes and sometimes disastrous, but you did it. When you do something practical, and you're going to do a stunt practically, people don't realize how difficult it is and how many departments are involved Mm. and what the work is. Yeah, I mean... there was a movie years ago called The Stuntman with Peter O'Toole. It wasn't a great film, but it was an interesting film. And the culmination of that film is an antique car racing over a bridge. And it's the whole end of the film, and the car's going, and we're looking at the girl, and we're looking at the guy, and all of this is happening. Great, long, wonderful scene. I'm doing a movie, and my director, wonderful guy from England, said, uh, we need that bridge because I want that shot. I want that long expansion bridge shot. Mm. And we said, okay, fine. I've got a good location manager. Uh, find that bridge and, you know, let's do it. So he starts researching San Diego because Stuntman was shot in San Diego. We're in Northern California. We're, we're basing out of Sacramento and shooting all around. And he's searching and he's searching and he's searching. And finally he comes back and said, I found the bridge. You're not going to be happy. <laughs> I said, why? He said, because the bridge is like 50 yards long. I said, no, 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 no. 
wrong bridge because I've seen the movie. It's a great long expanse. He went, look at the movie again and count the cuts in the bridge scene. Mm. You go back and you look at it. Cut, 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 cut. Different angle, different angle, different angle. They backed that car up and ran it and backed it up and ran it and backed it up and ran it. But when you look at the whole bridge, yeah, it's this little dinky bridge. It's in Northern California. Mm. It's out of, I think it was out of Stockton. And it's like, who did that? Who came up with that idea? Would I sit there and say, let's go CGI today? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because it took us days to get the scene we needed. And the barricade drops, and they're trapped on the bridge, and they can't back up. And they can't back up, hell, you can get out and just walk it. It's there. It's done. Yeah. So I admire greatly the people who figured out how to do that stuff. Have you seen how they're shooting the Mandalorian? Have you seen that? No. You got to see that. I'm gonna send you a YouTube link. The way they're the way they're doing that, they're doing it with a huge screen behind the actors. It's yeah. it's crazy. It, and James Cameron, um, when they did um, when they did Avatar, did you see that tech where the camera? Well, obviously, oh, yeah. you did see it where the any anywhere the camera um, shot, you could actually already see the CGI in the camera. Exactly, and that that's a system that he created. Yeah. Oh, mean, he he was the inventor of that. Well, not he didn't physically, but he said, "I want this to happen. Mm. I need the ability to do this." I mean. I started using green screen, I guess we all did when we started. And I did a lot of big scenes where we would, you know, green screen 80 feet, 90 feet. The oh. hard part about doing that was keeping it flat because it is a screen, it, it, it's a canvas stretch and you have to keep it absolutely rigid or you're gonna have your background going a little crazy. But I, I shot a, a rail yard in Toronto for the Thames River with London Bridge behind. And there's the, the eye, the, the big Ferris wheel and all. We're in a freight yard in, in, in Canada, Toronto. in Toronto, Canada. <laughs> but it, it had a spot where there were some cobblestone streets, so gave us cobblestone. We put a fake balustrade in with chain and just ran an 80-foot stretch of green screen. Wow. And it worked. That's great. I, I've, I've, I don't know. I'm such a... I love the visual stuff, and I'm such a fan of the, how all of that works, the chroma key and all that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> wow, you're going back. Yeah, I mean, I'm... You know, I'm a photographer, too, So, but I, that stuff just tripped... It always trips me out to just... To even just see, like, the Mandalorian, the way they the way they're shooting it now on YouTube, like they put up this whole behind the scene thing. Just, it's just incredible. It's incredible. Well, first, <clears throat> because somebody should, you are a brilliant photographer. Your work is phenomenal. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I am old school. I love to actually do it. Yeah. I am not a huge fan <clears throat> of CGI. Okay. Only because CGI has been used to a degree that takes the realm of possible reality and throws it out the window. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you see Lord of the Rings or any <clears throat> of those films, and you have your three heroes, and there are 4,000 bad guys riding <laughs> beasts coming at them, <laughs> and you go, they're dead. I'm sorry, they're dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're not good. A hundred, maybe. 4,000, <laughs> they're dead. <laughs> and the bodies are flying and horses are flying and all, and they're twirling in the air and they're slicing off 400 people's heads in one <laughs> swipe. I can't watch it. It's just, no. Because there's no sense of reality to it. At all, even though it's, yeah, I get that. You know? Uh, yeah. Master and Commander. Brilliant film. A lot of CGI in that film. Yeah. A lot. Had to be. But it was done in such a way that it was believable. Right. Those battles could have happened. <clears throat> that could have happened. 
So you watch it thinking, wow, that was, that was heroic stuff. Yeah. It if, just wasn't overdone. It wasn't overdone. <clears throat> the tendency is to overdo it. Yeah, and I feel like I feel like with CGI stuff too, it's dangerous in the fact in the in the in the thought that it can be a miss. So like when Black Panther came out, right, which I wasn't a fan of the movie anyway, but the CGI wasn't great. No, it wasn't. Right? Am I No, it really right? wasn't great. There were times where I was watching that movie in theater and I was going, Are you freaking kidding me? It wasn't the DGI just wasn't good when you compared it to the Avengers and and all of the Tony Stark movies and it just wasn't good. No, but that wasn't the point of the movie. Absolutely, the point of the movie was an African American hero, right? And that they did brilliantly, and the actor was, God bless him, superb. Yeah, he was. I don't know that anyone in making that film thought we will have a massive blockbuster on our hands. Right. I don't think that was a thought. So when you're budgeting that, eh, we're going to do some CGI, we're going to do some of this, we're going to do a little of that. It wasn't the priority. The priority was the story. It was the story. And that worked beautifully. And, you know, you strip it all down, it worked beautifully because you had a great actor. Yeah, he was a killer actor. And that's, sure. that's the whole thing. Yeah. Catherine Hepburn had a great line. I actually have it in my office, or had it in my office. And it was meant towards other actors and producers and directors and anybody else. And it was, we're paid to stand and deliver the lines. Read them, deliver them, and shut up. Mm. Remember <laughs> that it's all in the writing. Mm. And in a sense, she's right. It's performance and it's story. If you don't have either one of those, you don't have a show. Yeah. I don't care how much CGI, I don't care how much you do, you don't have a show. Who could have played Tony Stark better? Yeah, I don't know. I still... Nobody. Yeah, I don't think anybody could Robert have Downey Jr. was brilliant. Yeah. Because you almost didn't... I mean, he was the Cary Grant of Robert's... Uh, of of uh, Tony Stark. Absolutely. He had that Shvodaviv, he had that fling, that character. I, who else could have done that? Yeah. That's like, for me, that's uh, for me, like Heath Ledger's Joker. Yes. Unbelievable. Even Joaquin's was great, but Heath just did something to that character that was... Joaquin became too intense. Yeah, he dug in, for he sure. He dug in. What I loved about Ledger was there were moments. Yeah. There were little moments <laughs> where you could see him sitting there going, oh, I like this. Yeah, I yeah, like yeah, this. yeah. You never got that. With Joaquin, it was just darker and darker and harder and harder. You need to let an audience breathe every now and then. You've got to breathe, let them have yeah. a breath. Yeah. Even if it's subtle, even if it's something they don't get until the third viewing. Let them have that. Yeah. Because you can just drag that. Th I I watched it and regretted every minute of it. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I was uh, when I f f when I heard they were making a Joker movie, I was like not interested. Then I heard it was Joaquin, and I thought, okay, m maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But if I I think for me the Joker uh, Joaquin's version of it, if you see it for what it was or what it is, then you're like. Okay, I understand it. Not my cup of tea. Now, like you're saying with Heath, though, uh, there's that line when he's like, "I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do if I caught one." You know, he exactly. Just, and you're laughing. You're like, "This guy's, he's nuts," but he's also funny. And and even Jack, even uh, even the oh, way even oh. the way Jack Nicholson and you know Jack told him, you know that yeah. story, right? Oh yeah. Apparently, told him not to take that role, but. Uh, let's talk about Jack Nicholson. <laughs> so uh, when I, that movie came out when I was a kid, and um, I remember watching it and going, okay, yeah, that was a cool, that was kind of a cool joke. And see, Jack did just the opposite of Heath, but it worked with, he was more funny, and the, but when he got serious, yeah. he got serious. Because that's Jack. And that's, 
And Jack says all the time, every performance I do is different. And he's yeah. absolutely right. Every performance he does is different. But there's a jackness to what he does. Because mm. you know when he makes that turn, oh God, here comes, here comes the other side. Yeah. And he'll make that turn and he is just in your face. When I saw him in A Few Good Men, yeah, I was also... Riveting. Yeah, I was a teenager at that point, but I just thought, okay, this is my favorite actor, period. His ability to just turn on yep. that, I guess, a mean street. I don't know what it is, but in that movie... It's, it's just power. Yeah, it's just it's this incredible there force. There you go. It's just power. That's what it is. He just, I mean, that courtroom scene, I'm sorry, he blew everyone off that screen. It, 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 there was no actor that could compete with him. Yeah. He, yeah. That whole movie, even, even when um, they get to Guantanamo and they're sitting at lunch and his condescending way of dealing with Demi's character, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was so subtle. And I think I watched it maybe like maybe on the fourth time of watching it. I was like, wait, holy shit. I'm like, this yeah. dude is being an asshole right now. And you don't catch it. The subtle, the little subtleties of how he was treating her the whole time. Because he wasn't being an asshole. He was an asshole. It's just what he was. Wow. And because it came across so beautifully, you think, oh, that was tough. Oh, wait a minute. He was really an asshole to her. Yeah. But he was him. That He was that character. Now you worked, okay, so you know where I'm going with this, right? So you got, you got, you've, you got a chance to work around I him. had a chance to work with Jack on a movie called The Border. Okay. Uh, Tony Richardson directed it. Um... Jack, Jack was one of the coolest people I ever worked with on a very difficult film. It was not difficult because of him. We actually wound up shooting that film in continuity, which is unheard of in the industry. So uh, what, is, what, is the, what does that mean? Okay, you have a script, it's a book, you read it. And they start out in Bill's house, and then they go to John's house. And then later they go back to Bill's house, and then later they go back to John's house. When you're scheduling a film, you're boarding it, you take all of the scenes at Bill's house, and you shoot them in one lump. Because you're going to build that house, you're going to hire the supporting actors for those scenes. You get them in, you get them out, they're off the clock. Move on. And however long it takes, you just do it. You do it. So... Okay. In the film, you're talking 90, 100 minutes, 120 minutes. Maybe there are four film days or even five film days that are going to happen in in that house. But you don't come back. You no. Know, once you're done, you're, you're done. done. You're done, you're right. done. Shoot the day scenes, the night scenes, the exteriors, the interiors, and all the support cast. When our director wanted to do it, he felt creatively that we go to Bob's house and then we're going to go over to John's house and then later we'll come back to Bob's house and then later oh we'll go back God. to... Which means every actor who would have been hired for two days' work, maybe four days' work, now is on a run-of-the-picture contract. Oh, my God. The house that you pick, because we're filming this on location in, in uh, Texas... We got to keep that house. We have to keep it for months because we not only have to dress it, but we wanted to build a garden. And then we decided let's put a pool in. So we actually wound up buying the house. Universal bought a house. We were in the real estate market. They bought that house, but we just bought it so that we could do all of that to it. Wow. We had a director who would get to the house and say, I don't want to shoot that scene. I'm going to shoot this scene today. But we have a Titan crane because we were shooting an exterior yard scene. And we've got a water truck because we were doing the night scene in the rain. Now you want to shoot the scene in the bedroom. <laughs> um, what are you going to do? But 
in that particular case, Universal wanted another Jack Nicholson movie. The director created the thought with Universal that he and Jack Nicholson were very close. It wasn't necessarily true. So the director went in there and was like, oh yeah, me and Jack and I are friends, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> they had met and Jack knew who he was. He'd done some very interesting work, Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. Okay. Great film. Esoteric. Art house film, but really nice. And he had said to Jack, you know, let's do a film together sometime. It would be lovely. Okay, fine. Actually, that movie was bought by Universal as a two-hour MOW, a TV movie. Okay. And Robert Blake had been hired to play the lead. To play Jack's, Jack's role. When Richardson came back to Universal and said, I can get Jack Nicholson. The studio paid off. Robert Blake expanded the script. And we had Jack Nicholson in a movie that should really never have been made as a feature. Really? Uh, Robert Blake is the, is that Beretta? Beretta. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we had Ry Cooter do the music for it. We, we had a lot of interesting elements. But it should never have been what it was. We had challenges. We were filming on the Rio Grande River in El Paso, Texas. And there are scenes where we're supposed to have uh, Mexican nationals coming across as illegals and Jack Nicholson played the Border Patrol. And <laughs> Tony, our director, would stand on the riverbank because we're right across from a settlement area and wave money and say, come, come and get the money. Come over now. Come and get the money. And people are running into the river. So the people across the border. Across the border. Oh, my God. So it's like, whoa. And they we were can't do that. shooting that? Yeah. So we had to stop that. We had to stop that. We had to build <laughs> coffer dams in the river. We had to put underwater ropes so that if anybody tripped or stumbled, they could grab a rope. You know, the, a lot of safety precautions had to be done. <laughs> We had a sequence where the young girl, Piria Carrillo, wonderful Mexican actress, is coming to America. That becomes the story, and Jack ultimately saves her. But she and her brother and her baby are coming, and there's a shot as they come up on a little bluff, and they look and they see America. And it's divided by a railroad track. And you can't use Union Pacific forget it will not allow it they did years and years ago and there were some deaths and that was it you can't use them anymore you can't uh, Union Pacific was uh, railroad oh okay you couldn't the use train to film okay. cannot uh, became my job to find a train that we could use and I found a train <laughs> what was it called Oh, the Tex-Mex Railroad Line. And it was out of... Oh, God, it'll come to me in a minute. But it was way, way, way in the eastern part of the state. And it only ran 27 miles. That was it. So he had to move the whole company there to just shoot the train sequences. Right. Because uh, we had some really good stunts on that train. Um, Nuevo Laredo. Laredo, Texas, and Nuevo Laredo. So we were on both sides of the border. We shot on both sides. Hmm. And that was one of those deals where I went across the border and I went to the Cadillac Bar in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, with a couple envelopes of money and met some officials and we had a drink and the envelopes disappeared and we were allowed to bring our cameras over and set up on the bank and we could bring people through. It just, that's how it worked. And we protection, got it done. Protection and everything on the Oh, everything. Side. Everything was done. A little hard explaining that to the accountants at Universal. Right. You know, where did that 10 grand go? Well, Where's the receipts for that? <laughs> nobody signed for that one. <clears throat> but we, we, uh, 
We made it work, but Jack was an absolute delight to work with because Jack spelled out everything Jack required. Right. Contract, 27 pages. No surprises. None. Uh, cars. We had to use his cars. We would bring them from California. We had to truck them in, and then he would ride in those cars. His own drivers would drive them. Mm. When we were through, if they needed repainting because of blowing sand, if they needed new tires, everything was spelled out. The only thing that wasn't spelled out, we rented a great house for him in New Mexico. We're right at the border of Texas and New Mexico, and there was a nice housing development about 10 miles from our offices. And we rented him a nice house, which I then had to get the permit so we could land a helicopter on the cul-de-sac <laughs> so we could fly Jack to the set. And then Harvey Keitel heard about that, and then Harvey wanted a helicopter. Uh, and, was he on that set? Yeah. Too? What? Yeah, Jack Nicholson, Harvey Keitel, Warren Oates. We had a great cast. Oh, yeah. Um, Harvey's a, I feel like Harvey Keitel doesn't get his due, though. He's a, he's a bad boy in terms of acting. In many ways. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I like him as an actor. As an actor, he's, yeah, very, very good. Hmm. Very unpredictable. But he was on the show. Um, yeah, it was just, it, there were challenges, but there are challenges to all of them. But was Nicholson easy to work with? Was he pretty cool with everybody for the most part? Or? Jack was very cool. Jack had his rules and regulations, but he came at the very start of the picture and he just said, look, I don't work before 10 in the morning. I don't work after this hour at night. But if you need me, if it's required and you have a reason for it, ask me. Ask, yeah. And, like you know, if you haven't been abusing it, you got it. I'll do it. Man, that's, uh, yeah, that's definitely one one actor that I would have gone out of my way to see. And you also, uh, so you also worked on, um, not to bounce around, but why it's on my mind. So you also did a show with Tay Diggs called... Yes. Kevin, Kevin... Kevin Hill. Kevin Hill, okay. Super guy. I love Tay. Yeah, well, my uh, Bridget, uh, one night, she's... she. We, were at, we, we lived in Bellevue here in Nashville at the time, and she's on the phone talking to Adrian, and they're laughing... And she's talking about, oh, well, you know, that's just how, and I, I don't know what they're talking about. So Bridget hangs the phone up and uh, I'm like, what's going on? She goes, oh, um, something about Michael um, and, and he's, he's getting ready to get this show with, uh, with uh, Tay Diggs and all this stuff. So I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. And she's like, yeah, apparently he's, uh, Adrian called him or something. And he's like, oh, I got to call you back. I'm dropping Tay off. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I look at her and I'm like, Tay Diggs? And she's like, yeah, he's like taking day, Tay Diggs home from like the supermarket or something. So, <laughs> That's absolutely so obviously, true. obviously you and that guy had a good relationship and I want to hear about that. So what was that? What was it like working with him? Was he pretty, obviously he was pretty cool. Oh, very cool. Uh, remember, he hadn't done episodic television. Yeah, which I was pretty I was pretty shocked about when Bridget said that you guys were doing that show cuz at that time he was he was still pretty hot on the movie Very hot. Side. Very hot and thankfully his career continued yeah. after that show. The show was high-powered uh top firm attorney who is presented out of the blue from a long ago one night stand with an infant. Hmm. She's dead. Baby's his. The Good mom's luck. dead. The right. mom's yeah. dead. And he can't stay at the firm, blah, blah, blah. He finds a practice that's all women. And he goes in. The hardest part about the show was finding the baby. W.C. Fields had it absolutely right. Never work with dogs or babies. Or babies. <laughs> Never do it. We went nuts trying to... We reshot elements of the pilot three times before the show got picked up because nobody liked the baby. Mm. First, you're looking for twins because of work hours. You, just, you can't keep them working that long. So you need twins. You need to be able to swap them out. 
Uh, we couldn't find him. We couldn't find him. We couldn't find him. We finally found one baby that was perfect. I mean, this is an infant that you could almost say, okay, hit your mark, give me a little look, <laughs> and this kid would do it. I mean, it was brilliant. But it's only one, and right. there are hours, and there are light conditions. And so we had a beautiful animatronic infant made. Wow. That at least on semi-background scenes, we could have it held, and the little hand would go up, and the things and that. So we could intersperse that with our one real baby. This baby was perfect. Tay would spend so much time holding that infant, just talking to it off camera, just... I mean, he became the dad. Really? Oh, yeah. That's cool. Oh, yeah, he was he was great. His wife at the time, uh, I guess, Adina Mazel, everybody knows from Frozen, yeah, she the was, voice. She was on Broadway at the time? Oh, yes, yeah. she was doing a show on Broadway. And she was having some trouble. And... Uh, we had to step in and we had to take care of Tay at the same time. She was getting hassled uh, by some groups in New York because of being married to an African-American. Mm. While she was on... While she was on Broadway and they were coming around to the alley. Really? As a cast coming out at night, hassling her. Huh. So we had to get security in there we had to get the police involved uh, it, it it became a big deal and Tay was just because I said get on a plane Tay go and I said no I said I'll finish the scene I'll, I'll do this he was great super guy yeah that's funny Bridget's the to, uh, and uh, another story too so apparently you guys, because you lived mainly in Toronto. Yeah, right. You I were, kept an apartment in Toronto. Yeah, and you flew back and forth to... There was a, a period where the production value out of Toronto, it had the studios. It had an 80% of an infrastructure in place. And the dollars, it was... We were, we were getting a 68 cent dollar when I started. Wow. So every Canadian dollar was only costing 68 cents. Then 25% tax credit on direct to, spend. To shoot there in Toronto. To shoot there. Yeah. Are you kidding me? So it just, we just, that was it. Uh, Pinewood Studios had come in. I happened to know the chairman, uh, Paul Bronfman. I moved into Pinewood as their first tenant and beautiful studio facility, great stages, great offices. And I set up offices with the understanding that I would bring X number of shows in. Hmm. You let me stay. So when I wrapped a show, everything stayed. The offices, the furnishings, the fax lines, the emails, the, the phone lines, Everything stayed. Because a big expense when you start a show, particularly a pilot, right. is just getting it up and running. I had everything. Everything was up and running. That's cool. We walk in tomorrow, we start shooting. We're ready. Yeah, and it worked out beautifully for oh, a lot of years. Yeah, you were there for quite some time. Well, when I met when I met Bridget, she um, she didn't know anything about me and music and anything like that. So she actually walked into my condo in Encino and found out that I was a musician and all this stuff. But eventually, she actually didn't speak about you guys till uh, maybe a week before I got to the vineyard to, <laughs> to visit for the first time. And she's like, hey, so just so you know, um, my uncle is, uh, uh, he's in TV and film and you're coming to an island. And, uh, and I, I, I had no idea when I got there. When I got there, it was nighttime. And she drove me through Edgartown, and she was like, well, this is where they filmed Jaws. Yeah. So the next morning, she takes me back into Egg Edgartown, and I'm like, oh, holy crap, I'm in Amityville. This is crazy. That's right. So I, yeah, she, um, but she was telling me that, I guess, uh, one time you guys, Adrian had just gotten in, and you were taking her to the studio, and she goes, oh, that guy, that's a handsome guy. He looks familiar. And you're like, who, Ethan Hawke? Yeah. 
<laughs> Bridget, yeah. she always, Bridget always gives me these little gems of like all these little things that happen. I'm like, wait, what happened? She goes, yeah, apparently my aunt's checking out Ethan Hawke. And he's, she's like, who is that guy? And you, of course, my uncle's like, you you know that to Ethan Hawke. She's like, I don't know who he is. I just know he's a, he's a, he's a cute guy. So she, Bridget's always giving me the goof, the little goof stories. When I brought Adrian to L.A., we met in Europe, we went to Africa, we finally came back. And we came back the week that my parents were throwing one of their annual parties. And these were big black tie parties. My mother had been an actress, my father had been a producer and an agent. And she's already stepping into, I mean, she's been living in Spain, but she's a girl from Texas whose father was a minister. And now she's in evil Hollywood. But she's from small town Texas. Small town right? Texas. Your wife, Adrian. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, here's literally a lot of Hollywood. So my parents would always pick tables. And as family members, you were to host a table. Okay. And she's seated not with me. Because at that point, she's in the family. So she has to... I brought her back. She has to, you know, that's it. So she's seated at a table, and I look over, and she's seated next to Jules Stein. Jules Stein was the head of MCA Universal. Hmm. Jules Stein was probably, at that time, the single most important man in Hollywood. And she's seated next to him. (laughs) And I thought... Small town girl from Texas. If (laughs) I go up to her and say... This is a guy who could crush everybody's career in this room. Right. <laughs> I, I can't do that to her. So I asked her to dance. We're dancing. He said, the cutest little guy is next to me. And Jules was a little guy. He says, very, very nice. What does he do? And I said, he's an eye doctor. Because he was. I mean, the Jules Stein Eye Clinic was his, along with several other things. <laughs> and she went, oh, eye doctor. Nice man. I didn't tell her for weeks who he actually was, but he loved Adrian. Yeah. And he threw a reception for Princess Grace at the Jewel Stein Eye Clinic. And we went, and Doris's wife would leave her purse with him, and he was just sitting at a chair. And there's Princess Grace of Monaco. And he saw Adrian, said, Adrian, Adrian, come here, Adrian. He, he calls. Oh, me. yeah, he called. <laughs> and she got a chair and she sat next to him. And that's it. And they would sit every party from there on. Julie wanted Adrian to sit next to her. And I'm thinking, put in a word for your husband. Right, it right. It wouldn't hurt. <laughs> right. but, but at that point, uh, <laughs> yeah, Universal and I were not getting along, so it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And Grace, uh, Princess Grace was Grace Kelly? Grace Kelly, yeah. Okay. One of the last things she did before she died. Yeah, she. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Bridget was breaking that down to me the other day because <clears throat> we were at lunch and I wasn't. I was trying to connect those dots. But uh, uh, and your parents were good friends with uh, with uh, Lucille Ball and oh yeah, husband. and Desi. Yeah. Now that's cool. That was cool to hear to find out because you know I mean I'm I'm 41, grew up watching. The reruns. You're 41. I'm 41. I mean, mm. Mm. <laughs> is it? Can you be up? <laughs> it's past my bedtime, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I grew up watching all the reruns. And stuff. I know who Lucille Ball was. So, uh, first time Bridget told me that, I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? She's like, No. My <laughs> uncle grew up around all those folks. And so I always thought that was kind of cool. Um, so, do you, do you have many memories? Of Some of them, yeah. yeah being I mean, around. Orson Welles is a big memory. Uh, saw Orson a lot. Dad represented him. Uh, As an agent? Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. And they were friends. Um, probably the... the it, it just... Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, we can tread down that road sometime. It, it's uh, a lot of fun things. Cary Grant was my godfather, and that was a thing. Yeah. Uh, when Carrie was dating Diane Cannon, they were keeping it very quiet. 
So they would meet at my parents. And Diane would leave her car, and they would go out and come back and drop it. They got married, had their daughter. Diane gets an offer to do a Broadway play called 90 Day Mistress with Marty Milner. I am now, this is my phase in New York as a page. This is when you're back in New York, okay. $56 a week. I'm living at the Henry Hudson Hotel on 10th Avenue. God, I got I got robbed in the lobby the first week I was there. Oh, the Henry Knife Hudson, point. really? Yeah, robbed in the lobby. Not a great area. Yeah. I get a call from Uncle Kerry. Explains that Diane's going to be coming back to do this play. And they had decided she needed an escort. Somebody who was acceptable be the escort. Would I be willing to do that? I'd have to move into the Pierre. Oh, darn. I would have a car and driver and I would have signing privileges all over New York. Sheesh. Didn't take me long to answer yes. <laughs> so now, you $56 a week page is living near the suite in the Pierre Hotel. I have Cary Grant's limousine. Sheesh. And we're going out every night. It was kind of fun. I bet. <laughs> Ricky <laughs> Dreyfus was doing a movie in Florida, but he would come up on weekends. And he was your buddy, huh? You guys, oh, yeah. You guys grew up together. We grew up together. Well, we grew up, started in high school, freshman in high school. And I'm still in touch with Ricky. Yeah. Well, he, uh, called, he called the house once, and I picked up the phone. <laughs> That's very possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, that happened on my first visit. Uh, I... It was either him or some. Well, he called, and Adrian asked, "Hey, will you grab that?" So I I picked up the phone, and I and I told her who it was, and she goes, "Yeah, it's from Michael. She took you the phone," and I turned up to Bridget and I go, "Dreyfus, like, <laughs> yeah, Dreyfus," and she goes, she just looks at me and goes, "Yeah," and I'm like, "Mr. Holland's open?" She goes, "Probably, yeah." Yeah. What the heck? I'm like, where, where the hell am I right now? <laughs> well, I was coming, you got to understand, I was coming from like probably the worst part of Philly. And then I go to see this girl that I'm dating. And then I walk into this snow globe of a world. <laughs> I just looked at Bridget. I'm like, where am I right now? She's like, I told you, don't even ask. Just yes. That's probably who it was. It's, it's not that we didn't realize things were special yeah but how special didn't register because it was special for you but it was special for ricky it was special for rob it was special for, you just i can remember going we used to go over to rob reiner's and his dad and mel brooks were still doing uh you know the, their comedy routines and I think the first album had just come out, which was, uh, what was it? Is that Did, the I'm sorry, not to cut you off. Rob Reiner started as a comedian or in comedy? No, no, no. His father, oh, Carl Reiner. Oh, okay. Oh, I had no idea. Carl Reiner and Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks were a comedy team. Did not know that. And then Carl Reiner became a director. Right. And was brilliant. <laughs> And no. they would sit in the living room, two opposite sofas, and Carl would have a little portable typewriter on his lap. And Mel would sit over there, and they would just start riffing. Firing off Joe, oh man. And oh, we would try and be quiet, but we'd start breaking in. He'd say, get the hell out of here. What the hell are you kids <laughs> doing? Get out of here. <laughs> it just, I mean, the 900-year-old man. What's the greatest invention? Saran wrap. You can <laughs> wrap things. In. I mean, these are great routines. But yeah, Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks. Man. And you can still get them. You know, the albums are out there. I had no idea that Mel... Uh, Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner... That's crazy. We're comedians. That is crazy. Well, yeah. I, I knew that. I knew, obviously, Mel Brooks, he's a, you know... 
guy's a legend. Well, believe me, Carl Reiner was right up there. Wow. And then, of course, Rob. Uh, and you, did you, so you knew Rob coming up to Yeah, his... we went all through school together. Yeah. And, uh, and I was dating Sally Struthers, and they get, you know, they're... They end up getting hitched. No, no, no. no? They did a series together called... Was it uh, Three's Company? No. no. Archie Bunker. Oh, yeah. yeah. They did All in the Family. That's No, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Carl wa- or uh, Rob yeah. Reiner was Meathead. That's right. Meathead. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? Because uh, when I started seeing his name on director stuff. Yeah. Pretty good director stuff. Yeah, I was like, wait a like minute. Like a few this good is the guy from, Yeah, Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I keep forgetting he was Meathead. Yep, he was Meathead. And it's the same thing with um, the redhead from um, uh, from the Happy Days. Oh, God. Are you kidding? Right. Um, now you're um, talking about a real director. That's... Uh, Although what, they're both probably what's, what's equally his, as good. What's his name again? I know it's escaping me right now. <laughs> I know, me too. Don't worry about it. Oh gosh, this thing's gonna be over, and I'm gonna be like, "Damn it, that's his name." Well, anyway, but that's a big, that's a big name right there. Yeah, I think even bigger than than uh, than Rob Reiner, no? Yeah, yeah, he's certainly done more things. Yeah, uh, and big things. I mean, Apollo Eleven. Uh, did he do? Uh, Ford, yes, yes he did. I'm not sure. The, the film uh, it just came out a year or so ago. Uh, oh, Ford versus uh, yeah Ferrari. Uh, yeah. Or yeah, 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 yeah. Great movie, by the way. Why the great hell? movie? Oh, I don't know. It'll come in a moment. Yeah, it, this it'll be like ten o'clock tonight. In the <laughs> but yeah, I was always um, Ron Howard. Ron Howard, thank you very much. Yes, Ron Howard. But yeah, I, I when I started seeing uh, uh, Rob Reiner and stuff, it, it didn't dawn on me till way later. Like, God, that was meathead the whole time. Yeah, that Richie Cunningham. Yeah, Richie. That's what I'm saying. That 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 um of that cast, would you have looked at that and went, Oh yeah, he's gonna be like huge Mm-mm. Academy Award winning director? And no idea. I had no idea until I saw a picture and I went. Oh my God! What? Yeah, I had no idea. Now he's doing. Have you seen those master class things where? Um, yeah, yes. he's got like a whole series. Yeah, I'm sure it cost somebody a pretty penny to get him to come Uh-oh. in. And, and well, maybe, maybe not. Unless he's got some stock. Yeah, I mean, maybe not. Some sort of stock or ownership in that whole thing. And some just give. You know. Yeah, I, I didn't know. I'd love to pretend that I did. But I didn't know George Lucas. I had met him a couple of times. Very nice. He and and my good friend John Millies at the time were, were good friends because they were all the SC guys. Okay. And uh, we're doing a film. Oh, that movie I told you about that I'm shooting up in Northern California. And I get a call from Lucas Films, and they said, uh, we're doing a screening at our offices. Do you think you and maybe some of your cast or executives would like to come? And it was like, yeah, that could be fun. Thinking, yeah, okay, they're just gonna run something and we'll get to sit in the room. So I took, God, I took the director, I took, only a couple of people wanted to go. Well, it was in George's office. Hmm. And it was with George. And we're watching, and now I'm blanking, that brilliant film after the funeral and they all go back to the house and everybody sits around and talks about it. And it'll come to me in a minute and I'll kill myself later because it's one of my favorite movies. It's a George Lucas film? Yeah. And we sat and we watched, no, it, George Lucas's, oh God. 
come to me in one minute. Yep, there you go. Uh, <laughs> got to <Good old> Google. <laughs> I, you know, IMDb. Do you think, um, what are your thoughts on that whole Weinstein thing? Oh, absolutely true. Yeah. and uh, Did that happen? Oh, my God, yes. But that's nothing new, right? I no, think guys have no, been no, playing no, that no. game for a long time, and, and even maybe some some powerful women in that world. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One of them is still alive. Yeah. Yep. I'm not going to give you her name, but you do her beck and call, and, and things will work out a little better for your career. Yeah, the Weinstein thing is is heavy, but the first thing I said was like, all right, well, let's line all the guys and girls up that are powerful in that world, and let's look at all of them. Not saying that what he did wasn't terrible, but it's just like, that. this is probably nothing new under the sun, right? We should be looking at the, the gamut itself. Um, it's not new under the sun. What is reprehensible about it is that people have that kind of power. Yeah. Do my bidding or I will wreck you. Or I will wreck you, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, wonderful actors named Tippi Hedren. I know that name. Tippi's a, a good friend, has been for a lot of years. And the director destroyed her. Mm. Absolutely destroyed her because she wouldn't do his bidding. And that director, very, very big man. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of respect for the Italian model that basically exposed him. Because she basically said absolutely not, and she started recording, right? That's yep. how she was able to put out that whole thing to Yeah, where with. is she today? She's nowhere. I mean, yeah. no, she's not. She's definitely not a public figure, but, I mean, you know, where's the, where's, where's the line? Where do we draw the line? Should he have been stopped? Yes. Should that put the fear of God in people who still do it? Yes. But I can tell you exactly how they get around it. Yeah, I'm sure. Because there was a case when I was running Cannell Productions, there was a case of an assistant director at Universal. And his deal, back then, extras, there was a union, the Screen Extras Guild, SEG. And it had benefits and it had retirement funds and it had residuals and it had, it was a pretty good deal to get into the SEG. To get on a show, the assistant director picked the background. They picked the extras. Hmm. And he had a deal. Because you could bump an extra. Extra would come on and was going to make 80 bucks for the day. You gave them a close-up, that's a feature. Then they get some more money. You give them a line, now they're an actor. Uh. And you can Taft-Hartley that line, but after two Taft-Hartleys, you have to then let them join the union and they become Screen Actors Guild and their whole life just changed. So that's how they can get into SAG, just with yep. one, wow. And okay. this kid was exploiting it with pretty cute extras. Yeah. And believe me, we all flirted with pretty cute extras when we were ADs. But you didn't hold it over them. Yeah, you just yeah. hoped that, hey, being on the show, yeah, it was nice. But you didn't say, do this or else. Or else, yeah, yeah. He got caught. He was thrown out of the Director's Guild. He was never allowed to work on a set again. Wow. And he deserved it. And it didn't take more than a month for somebody to come up with how they fix that. Mm. Very easy. If you're the guy, you have a cute girl, he said, I think I can put you in this show. I'd like you to go see Michael, who's over here at this studio. Be nice to him. Be nice to him. Mm. And if you are, he's going to tell me you're nice, and I can help you. So they quickly figured out ways Pass to come. Pass it off. Yeah. And that's and how those circles start, right? That's yeah. how those secret societies start. And it just keeps start. going. And it just keeps well, going. well, listen, thank you uh, for for your time and everything for coming out. Uh, let's just do a quick gem section. So top three things that you would uh, consider to be good advice to people, young people, or anybody trying to get into the film industry. Okay. Volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. 
Okay. Case in point, on the show America, we started pre-production at ABC offices, not studio, in Century City. A kid was brought in, he'd been on another show as a PA. He came over and said, I hear you guys may be starting up. I, you know, I know my way around the building. Can I help? So we brought him in. He worked for maybe a month for free. We put him on salary as a PA. I think they were making like 70 bucks a week or something. It was ridiculous. Hmm. Finally, we got the green light after months. We're going to go to Lincoln, Nebraska. And we're going to start shooting this thing. And we liked this kid. He was really good. We're going to Nebraska. I can't take a PA to Nebraska. He said, if I were there, would you hire me? And I was like, of course we'd hire you. I was the production manager of the show. I said, God, yes, you're, you're great. He gets in his old beat to shit little Volkswagen. He drives to Lincoln, Nebraska. Says, I'd like a job on the show mm. as a PA. We make an arrangement at the hotel. He's going to room with one of the grips. We'll cover his food on craft service. Yeah, he's okay. We can bring him in. By the time that show was over, he was an apprentice in the Directors Guild of America as a second, second assistant director. Sheesh. He just kept offering. Let me step up. Let me step up. That would be number one. Nobody's going to hire you as a producer. Yeah. You want to come in and show us what you've got and your passion? Absolutely. Number two, admit it. Everybody in the business will fuck up somewhere. Yeah. You do. It's nature. Own it. I screwed up. I shouldn't have done that. I did it. I'm sorry. 90% of good production people, production managers, ADs, are going to say, okay, moving on. Put that behind you, learn from it, let's move on. It's the ones who start covering their ass and pointing over here, and uh, they didn't tell me. Just own it. Mm. Those two things, know what you want to do. Have an end plan. You don't just want to make movies. Yeah. What do you want to make? That's always the line, right? Yeah. I just want to make movies. I'm going to make movies. Okay, go make a movie. Yeah. Do you want to be a grip, a gaffer, props, wardrobe? What do you want to do? You want to be a producer? I started out as a PA. Then I worked in locations. Then I worked in commercials as, a, as an AD and as a production. You work your way up. Right. It's how it happens. Yeah. There is no instant gratification. No, none. Not even for a producer slash actress's kid, right? <laughs> well, most people have to. I mean, is it is it? Would it be safe to say that you're glad that you worked your way up the ladder and didn't just have some some shot? I didn't have an an option. Yeah, my yeah. parents were horrified that I quit medicine. Mm, they did okay. not want me to do that. Right. Uh, my father knew how the business worked. You'd be a doctor. You know, you got a check. You got an office. You're there. So, no. The couple times he tried to, to help me out. I think I, I told you that one story. Um, and that will save that one for the next time. Yeah, yeah. But it didn't work at all. It was a catastrophic failure. Yeah. So, no. Uh, it helped me in the sense that I knew who the players were. They didn't impress me at that mm, point. Right. Very few impressed me. So, yeah, I wasn't starstruck kid. I just wanted to learn how to do it. Right, so that you could do it on your own. Yeah. Everything else will follow. So there's your big, big gem. Thanks, guys, for listening. Um, make sure that you subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and um, the YouTube videos for this podcast <clears throat> will always be condensed a condensed version, 10, maybe 15 minutes. But the full versions will always be on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. I will, uh, I won't see you because obviously I can't see you, but uh, 
Uh, we'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks.